Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. Welcome to Digital Domination Super Summit. This is where some of the smartest minds in tech share lessons and actionable tips to improve your business. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with successful entrepreneurs and leaders. Everyone who's live, put in your name, where you're from, put your questions in there. We'll take them throughout and at the end. But I'm going to introduce to you Zeke Camusio. Zeke Camusio is a serial entrepreneur who started and sold three companies. Zeke is the author of the Internet Marketing Bible and founder of Digital Aptitude. Digital Aptitude is a boutique digital marketing agency located in Portland, Oregon. Zeke, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. And I know you have a lot of jam-packed value to deliver for us because I follow your blog and I follow your content. You guys put out some great content, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say. But I want you to start off first by telling us the inspiration behind founding and starting Digital Aptitude. Yeah, so um, it was like uh, nine years ago now. Um, I, I wanted to help some friends. They wanted to go on vacation, and they just couldn't afford it. <laughs> and so it kind of started by accident, because they both of them uh, had companies. And um, I, my, my, my passion and my background has always been marketing. So I, I wanted to help them out uh, with, with their marketing so they could grow their companies, make enough money, and we could all go on a vacation. Um, it, it actually happened, it went really well, and we all went to Brazil for a couple of weeks. Um, and I realized that uh, marketing is the, the thing that I enjoy the most about starting a company or working as an entrepreneur. Um, so I started thinking about, you know, how can I do this full time? How can I just do marketing and not have to worry about finances or sales or operations? How can I just do marketing full time? So um, I, I decided to start an agency, uh, and that was back in um, 2004, I guess. So why did they ask you at the time? They saw that I wasn't successful with the business I had at the moment. I had a software company that grew really fast. Um, so they just wanted to, um, you know, uh, they just wanted some help. I mean, they, they were doing okay, but they needed a little boost. Yeah. And I wanted you to highlight and tell us a little bit about you know, digital aptitude and um, basically what was, what's a case study, that you, an example you can give from a client that you helped and what worked for them? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, we, we, are, we are a boutique, uh, very creative and very innovative uh, marketing agency. So um, the, way, the way I like explaining what we do is we, we talk to our clients about uh, where they are now and where they want to be in 12 months. And then we help them put together a digital marketing strategy to get in there. So let's say they're at you know, $1 million in annual sales and they want to get to $2 million. So we, we help them craft that strategy to get there within that year. Um, and we use a variety of dif different uh, digital marketing tactics uh, like uh, search engine optimization, uh, social media marketing, email marketing, uh, and we actually work a lot on their actual websites to make sure that you know once we get all the traffic to the site, those people are actually buying and you know submitting uh, you know uh, contact forms or whatever it is that the client wants them to to do. Um, so yeah, we uh, we we take care of the whole process from beginning to end, uh, from the moment somebody finds the website to the moment they you know completed checkout process or they contact the company. Yeah. So you work on the whole funnel and I know we're going to get in the presentation but what's one thing you can talk about that has worked really well for your clients so that we can use it also? Um, so I think that um, I, I could talk all day about tactics, I could talk about you know social media, I mean I could talk for hours about social media alone or SEO but I think that the most important thing is um, as a company, we have uh, five core values, and one of them is strategy before tactics. Um, so I think that that's extremely important. I think a lot of companies start thinking about, uh, you know, oh, I want to do SEO because I read somewhere that you know that's the thing to do, or social media. And the reality is that um, you actually have to start with the end in mind and build backwards from there. So you have to start thinking about how do people buy what I sell. 
and then you have to create a presence in all the places where they go look for information, uh, and be that one resource that they um, they, they want to connect with. That they, they you're the one giving them all the value. So by the time they're ready to buy, they want to buy from you and not somebody else. And I'll talk about that in a, in a little more detail in the presentation. But uh, I think that that's that's key. Um, coming up with a with a strong strategy before you even start thinking about what tactics will get you there. Yeah, yeah, I know that's the core of what you're going to be talking about because a lot of times we don't want to jump right into well, what do I do? How do I get to the number one of Google? And you're, I know you kind of construct an overall strategy, so I'll let you take over from here, and you can pull up your screen and go through and start um, your presentation. Um, basically, I, uh, I just uh, set up your whole talk with that, even though I was, I was wanting to get right into the tactics like everyone else does. All right, and, I, I, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well, because I think it's very important. Um, but yeah, let, let me let me get this set up. Yeah, I'll let you uh, pull up your your screen, get the slides ready, and uh, we'll go right into it. Can you so, see my screen now? Um, oh, yes, that's the last one. Yeah. Okay. Where you got it? You're right there. Okay, great. So the. The first thing I, I uh, noticed over the last, uh, you know, let's say 10 years is that, you know, let's say 10 years ago, let's say you had a hardware store, right? And the only competitor you had was the, the other hardware store in your town. But now with the internet, you're basically competing with every hardware store in the world, you know? So the, 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 the first thing that I want to talk about is um, how can you differentiate yourself among all the other companies in your space online, because that's 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 extremely important. I mean, uh, we as business business owners, we always think about you know our business and we think we're great, but how can we be perceived as completely unique? And a a concept that I really like came from a book that I read from Seth Godin, and Seth Seth Godin talks about the, the purple cow, and Basically, what he says in his book is that if you're, you know, driving on the road, you're not going to notice a cow that is a little taller or one that is a little bigger. But if you see a, a cow that is purple, that's going to get your attention right away. Um, and I, um, to me, this analogy makes a lot of sense. You know, because online is it, such a crowded space. So how can you stick out? Um, so I. I, I think there are a lot of different ways you can actually differentiate, um, and I have a few examples that I want to bring up. Uh, so one of the ways you can do this is by having a, a unique business model. Uh, so for example, in the software industry, the, the first example that comes to mind is Google, you know, where in a world where everybody was selling software, they actually decided to give it away for free and mo monetize their platform with uh, advertisement instead of software sales. Um, you can differentiate your product by supporting a cause. And uh, an example of this is uh, Tom's. And Tom's is basically a shoe company that donates a pair of shoes for every, every pair of shoes you buy. So, you know, it's just a regular pair of shoes like any other one out there. But everybody knows who, who Tom's is because of this, um, because they, they're not just selling a product, but they're supporting a cost and making you as a customer uh, a part of it. Yeah, they have a mission, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you can differentiate with a unique product. So uh, one, of, uh, one of my, right now I have two companies, Digital Aptitude is one of them. My other company is called Wingcatcher. So basically uh, my, my partner Ryan uh, came up with a way to inflate uh, a camping air pad in only 13 seconds. Um, so the, that was the biggest pain that people going camping had, you know, like you go camping. You oh, yeah, it's so annoying. You, yeah, <laughs> you it spend forever time. trying to inflate it and then deflate it. It never works properly. Right, and it takes uh, somewhere around seven minutes, and he figured out a way to do it in 13 seconds. So, like, having a unique product, a unique invention that, you know, nobody else has, definitely, you know, definitely gives you that competitive edge that we're talking about. Um, 
another way you can differentiate yourself is through the, the voice of your brand. And I think that two, uh, two really good examples here are uh, Ben and & Jerry and Zappos. I mean, these are two companies that have a very unique, a very informal voice, and they, they do that really well. So um, that's just another way you can be perceived as unique in your space. Um, then you have companies that are what I call contrarian or just controversial. Um, I just actually yesterday I came back from Vegas. I was there for a rugby tournament with you know some some of my rugby friends, and we went to a restaurant called uh, Dick's Last Resort. And the whole concept be be behind it is that the waiters uh, just treat you really really bad. You know, they just come <laughs> to your table. They throw the silverware at you. They're like, okay, set up your own table. We'll come back to take your order if we feel like it. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but this place was packed. And if you do a, a search on Google for uh, Dick's Last Resort, uh, you're going to find, you know, uh, hundreds of pictures of people posting, um, you know, their, their stay at, at, at this restaurant just because it's so unique. Um, I so I I think that, that you know that approach is, is very effective. You know, just figuring out what everybody else is doing and trying to find a, a different way to do things that have been done a certain way for a long time. Um, another way to differentiate is to be the most convenient uh, option in your space. And the first uh, example that comes to mind is Amazon. And, and I love Amazon. You know, they have you know one-click ordering, and they have my you know my credit card stored. They have my my contact information, my billing address. So all I need to do is just like um, go to a store, uh, snap a picture of a barcode. That's you know that, that that's gonna pull up my the, the product on my phone, and then I just tap once, and the product is gonna be at my door in a day. So um, you know they they. They're doing a really good job at making it very, very easy for people to buy from them. I think that's a really good point because a lot of people, if you go to their website and you go through the checkout process, they probably don't mean to, but it makes it really difficult. You're filling out one long form, then you're filling out another long form, and it just it makes you not want to follow through the process. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, like... Um, Amazon normally has the best price around, but even if it's like a dollar more expensive, like I'm, I'm happy to pay for that because like I just have to click once, and I don't have to spend ten minutes checking out, you know. So the, I mean, that's the, the thing about uh, differentiating is that you don't have to be uh, unique in every every different category. You know, I'm just like giving a lot of different examples or, or a lot of different uh, routes that you can take to be unique. But the whole point is that um, playing it safe is, is very risky, you know. Um, and uh, as an entrepreneur, that's probably the most important lesson that I learned because the way I started my first few companies is I would see something that's working out there and try to do it better, you know. Um, but the reality is that there's so much competition now that you're just one click away from all, all your other competitors that you have to think completely outside the box and be willing to take some risks to be, to be perceived as or to even be noticed. Because um, the, the way I, um, I think about marketing is the, the best kind of marketing you can get is word of mouth. Uh, you want people to, to talk about you. And for people to talk about you, you have to give them a reason to talk about you. Um, so being unique, doing something completely out of the ordinary, that gives people a reason to talk about you, whether it's uh, word of mouth or social media or you name it, or going to review you on, on a website. Uh, whatever it is, uh, being the, the, the one guy that, that is different in your space will make it a ton of difference. Yeah, and running all your companies and doing what you do, how did you decide to differentiate or make Digital Aptitude different? Yeah, so um, actually in, in, in a bunch of different ways, uh, but one of the, uh, one of the things that we, uh, makes us very different is that we, um, we take care of the process from beginning to end. So we don't just do one thing for, 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 for our clients. We don't just manage their AdWords campaign or just their social media. We understand that the, um, 
the, the process has to be completed, you know, so we, um, we only work with clients that, that allow us to take care of their entire, um, you know, marketing campaign. Just if your social media is not integrated with your SEO, which is not integrated with your, you know, the, the checkout process on your website, um, it's just not going to work. I mean, uh, just having one piece that works, um, the, the way I think about it is like, it's, it's like a car, right? Um, if the engine works but your wheels don't work, I mean, your car is not going to run. Uh, so we, we believe that companies need uh, work very similar as a car. You know, they have uh, a lot of different parts, and every part needs to work in order for the whole thing to work. Yeah, I see. So, like, someone comes to you and go, you know, it's like, we just want you to do social media. And you go, no, we don't do that. We have to integrate everything together. Right. I mean, and the, it's something that, that happens all the time is, you know, uh, we, we have clients coming to us saying, hey, we need help with social media. But we look at their products and we're like, you know, people are not going to talk about this online. I mean, this is just boring. Of course, we don't, just, we don't tell them that. We, 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 we make it sound a lot nicer. But we do tell them that they, their product is not, not unique enough and that we can, you know, push it online. But, you know, we can just give... We can just give something an initial push, and then it has to catch on on its own. People have to start talking about it. There's only so much you can do as a company to get the message out. Then yeah. it's up to your community or your audience to uh, keep spreading the word around. Um, so yeah, sometimes companies have a uh, they don't have a good product, or maybe they have a good product, but they don't have a web a website that uh, shows how good the product is. Or uh, sometimes, you know, there's a missing element that is breaking the whole uh, the whole machine. So we need to take care of those things as well because, you know, again, for for the whole car to work, every part of it has to work properly. Yeah, and that's a good point because I think a lot of people's products online they may feel like maybe they are boring. They're not sexy. You know, they right. sell pens or whatever it is. So how do you help them? you know, spread the word on that if maybe it is quote-unquote boring or how do you spice it up? Is there an example you can give where they thought, they may come to you and go, this is boring. I don't know how to how to get the word out on this. Yeah, I mean, the the first example that comes to mind is uh, a project that we, we, uh, we're actually working on now. Um, one of our clients sells uh, eco-friendly art supplies. And they have... The Not very sexy. Yeah, right. Right, but you know, once you start playing with them, it's it's such an amazing experience. I mean, uh, I um, I'm not a I'm not an artist myself, but I started playing with their products and I was like hooked from the get go. Um, and they they had a cool product, but they, they they weren't doing a good job at telling the story of what the product is. So we actually uh, just did, just last weekend actually we did a a really awesome video. We brought a lot of you know kids between four and six years old, and we just had them you know color and paint and just play around. And is I mean this project is looking so amazing. So it's sometimes you um, again you, you do have the the raw material, um, but you're not telling the story the right way. Got it. Okay, so I mean the. The uh, the takeaway for this first rule is that um, you know you have to differentiate or you're gonna die. Um, we we see companies um, you know closing their doors uh, every single day. You know hundreds of them just because they they're really clinging on to the old business model of hey you know if you have a good product and great customer service and your 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 prices are right uh, you're just gonna do fine. Um, but the internet has changed the game, and that's no longer the case. Uh, so, a lot of this happens to us when we talk to a lot of um, uh, business owners that have been around for a long time. You know, they they really uh, they don't like change. You know, and it is a very it's very difficult for us to have those conversations, and you know, just tell them that hey, you know, if you wanna, you know, uh, if you wanna be successful in this new space, you have to adapt. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of the first takeaway for for this first rule. Um, and I wanna move on to the second one, which is uh, reverse engineer your marketing. 
So uh, the concept of reverse engineering um, basically means taking something that works really well and break it down into parts to figure out how it's made. Um, so the the first question we we ask our, our clients is who's your ideal customer? Because it, it has to start there. You know, you have to know who it is that you're gonna be targeting. Um, then the second question is how does that person go about buying X, whatever it is you sell? Um, couches or you know video cameras and this is extremely important this is what we call pool marketing so what we need to figure out in this case is how people go about buying a certain product online so I want to share with you a story of um, an actual client that we worked with a few months ago uh, that we took through this entire process so there are a um, they're a yoga studio located here where I am in Portland, Oregon. And the, the first thing we, we asked them is, you know, who's your ideal client or ideal customer? And they told us it was women between 20 and 50 who live in Portland and are interested in having a healthy lifestyle. Um, so what we did is we just basically put uh, 12 of these women in a, in a room and we asked them, you know, if you... Um, you know, how, how do you go about, or like these were all women who, who done yoga before, so we asked them, you know, um, how do you go about finding the yoga studio where you work out now? Um, and the answers were really interesting. I mean, some were saying, you know, we, we just went to Google and did a search. Some went to Yelp and did some reviews. Um, some people got a recommendation from friends. So all this information was extremely valuable to us because now we, we know uh, how these people go through uh, the whole process. And if you, if you can understand how people go about uh, buying a certain product or service, then you can create a presence at every critical step of the way. Yeah, that's um, a good point. Yeah, and the other, the other question um, is uh, where is this person hanging out online? Uh, because there are two different kinds of marketing. There's pool marketing where uh, you basically um, get found by people that, that are in the market for your product. So, for example, like you know the yellow pages. You know, people uh, search for something specific. They just they can go to the yellow pages. Of course, nobody uses the yellow pages anymore. Most people just go to you know go to Google and do a search. But um, pool marketing is basically um, how do you get found by people searching for what you have to offer? Uh, but then you have the other side of it, um, and this is what, what we had to face with Wingcatcher, my other startup. We created a product that was uh, completely new. Nobody was looking for it. So that's a, that, that presents a completely different set of challenges, because now you're marketing a product that doesn't exist. People are not looking for it, because they don't even know it exists. But um, knowing who our ideal customer uh, was, which is out outdoor enthusiasts and people who go camping and hiking, uh, now we know where these people hang out online. Uh, they go to forums, they go to um, you know, certain blogs. So now we know where we can advertise or where, where we can create a presence um, so we, we get the attention of these people. So what could work the best with uh, the wing catcher example for you? With Wingcatcher, we were very lucky to get a lot of um, media coverage. Uh, we were on uh, CoolThings.com, uh, Popular Science, uh, Geek Dad. I mean, we got featured in over a hundred different blogs and magazines. Um, and it all started from a Kickstarter campaign that we we launched. Um, we had the goal to raise fifty thousand dollars, and we actually ended up raising a hundred and fifty thousand. Wow. Um, so yeah, it, that basically uh, sparkle everything else. Yeah. I mean, you say it's luck, but I know you, and I know that you do things methodically. So maybe you built on something else, but you did something to get into all those media. It didn't just happen by chance. Yeah, I mean, we um, we were we prepared really well. Uh, so basically, what we did is before launching. Uh, uh, the, the Kickstarter campaign, 
we made a list of the 100 most influential blogs for gadgets and outdoor gear. <laughs> and what we did is we actually um, got the, we connected with all the bloggers. We started follow, following them on Twitter, LinkedIn, we emailed them uh, regularly and started telling them, you know, um, like if there was something on their website that it was broken, we, we helped them realize or find it. Um, and we just we just made sure that for two or two or three weeks we were very useful to them in any way we could. So we sent them, uh, you know, news news pieces that we found that we we, we felt were going to be relevant to them. Um, we retweeted their stuff on Twitter. We um, we we just tried to connect. So by the time we we actually had something for them. They, they knew who we were and they um, you know they were willing to to, to uh, just basically get the word out about Wingcatcher um, and yeah so that that was part of it just like a little bit of preparation and then understanding what every uh, journalist or blogger was about what kind of uh, content they write uh, what kind of audience they target and then we had all the emails already written. So by the time we launched, we just like had to send them, and all the emails were yeah. personalized. You know, so we didn't send the same email to everybody. You know, we we customized every email based on the person we were uh, reaching out to. Um, so that was part of it. And every time we do a PR campaign, uh, what normally happens is uh, you start with the smaller guys, and you know, once a small blogger picks you up, you use that to leverage. Um, your your entry into some bigger blogger, a bigger blog. Um, so, and once you know as a medium sized blog, you know features you, then you can use that to like reach out to like a big blogger and say, hey, you know we just got featured here. I just wanted to let you know. So you use that uh, to like basically climb up the ladder. Um, but yeah, so it was uh, I would say. Uh, uh, one third luck, one third preparation, and one third which we, we honestly had set, like a really amazing product. Yeah. Because uh, you know, with without a good product, you know, you can do as much marketing as you want. Uh, but if it's not unique, if it's not innovative, if it's not something that you know, it's like, if it doesn't have the wow factor, people are just not going to read it or, or write about it. So it was a combination of uh, a lot of different things. Yeah, no, that's powerful. I'm glad you shared that because you really invested in that relationship and gave, gave, gave value before you even asked anything. And I think a lot of people do the opposite where we kind of just ask and we're not looking to, you I mean, you were looking at what you can help them with with their site or whatever you could do. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's a huge part of it for sure. Okay, so uh, going back to this yoga Yoga Studio. Um, we understood who their ideal customers were. We got them in a the room. We asked them how they found the Yoga Studio they were currently working at, um, working out at, and um, we also, you know, asked them questions about, you know, where do you spend time online? You know, we found out mo most of these people were were on, on Facebook and Pinterest, and there were certain blogs that it seemed like everybody was reading. Um, so this is really valuable information because now we know, uh, you know, where to play, where where we need to be uh, to get found, and also where do we need to be to reach out to people that uh, are not actively looking for a yoga studio, but they might actually be interested if we uh, if we were uh, if we were to be right in front of them. And the the fourth question is how can you get their attention? Um, so. In order to figure this out, what you need to, to ask people is why they're doing a certain thing, or what's like when you um, when you buy an iPad, for example, you're you're not just buying a, like a uh, a gadget. I mean, there's there's a reason you buy that. It could be for entertainment. It right. could be for because it makes you look good. It could uh, it could be because you like playing games. It could be because uh, you see that as a productivity tool. So you need to understand why people buy a certain thing because you're gonna use this information and in the marketing messages when you when you try to get these people to come to your site um, later. 
So what we found, talking yeah, to you're exactly right. Zeke, I want to just uh, interject yeah. for a second. That that was a, a perfect because if you know, it's almost the psychology behind why they're buying. If you know why they're buying, you can target the message to them. Right. Like I remember someone was telling me, you know, I I was always like when the iPad came out, why do I need an iPad? And then. I remember they said, someone just said, oh, I was on an airplane and playing with it. I remember my computer, would, the, the battery would die so quickly, and they were telling yeah. me how the, the battery lasted so long on the iPad, and they can you know, work on it for hours, and I immediately knew I had to get one. Right. So, yeah, so that, yeah, exactly. That hit home, that psychology behind it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, understanding why people do something will help you craft a marketing message that they're, they're going to respond to better. Yeah. So what we found uh, surveying these people is that the reason they were doing yoga is, uh, number one, they just wanted to be more relaxed. Uh, number two, they wanted to look uh, better. And uh, number three, they actually want to lose weight. Um, so now we, you know, we could write... Uh, uh, marketing content uh, targeting these three different goals. You know, it's like, hey, do you want to lose weight? Try yoga. Or, hey, do you want to look better? Do you want to be more relaxed? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, the, I think that the takeaway for this section here, the rule number two, reverse engineer your marketing, is that you have to ask yourself uh, these questions before you you get into any sort of marketing tactic. You need to understand who it is that you're trying to get uh, to, to get to pay attention to you, how they go about finding someone like you, where they hang out online, and what it is they need to say to get there to pay attention to you. Yeah. Do you find that when you're working with companies, and this is such an important step because this is the foundation of everything you're going to do, do you get pushback with companies because they say, Zeke, you know, we already know this, and maybe you're you're knowing, well, maybe we'll discover something else, and they don't want, they don't end up digging deeper. Does that ever happen? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's happened before. Um, we, the reality is that out of uh, three companies we start talking to, uh, two are not a good fit for us. Um, they. It, it could be for a number of different reasons, you know. But but if we if we feel, feel it, it's not a good fit, that's fine. I mean, we, we don't we don't we're not attached to working with every company that contacts us. If it's not a good fit, we just tell them. Uh, if they need need to work with a different company, we try to point it in the right direction. But um, yeah, sometimes they they're not not open to to new ideas, or they're not willing to take risks, or they. They, they dance things a certain way for so long that they, they don't want to change the way they do things. So, you know, if, if it's not a good fit, that's fine. I mean, we, you know, we, we understand that we're not the right agency for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but if we are going to work with someone, we, um, we need them to trust our process because we've been perfecting this for the last nine years, you know, and we know it works. We've tested it, you know, hundreds of times. Um, and it's not a magic pill. It's not something that you just turn on and it just works right away. The reality of marketing is that you can try a lot of different things, and most of them are not going to work right away. I mean, some need, need need for you to tweak them a little bit, and some are never going to work. Uh, the, the 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 important thing is, uh, and this is the right section for this, is uh, is to track uh, your ROI. Uh, and ROI stands for return on investment. So if you're trying, you know, five different things and you have the ability to track all five campaigns, maybe maybe you find that three of them are not profitable and only two of them are. Um, so it's really important to kill whatever is not working and re, um, reallocate your budget towards the things that are actually making you money as a company. Um, so let me let me show you something here. This is a very simple spreadsheet that, that we put together, um, and, and this is just an example. This is not from a from a real client, but this is just an example to to, to make a point. Uh, but we have two campaigns here. We have SEO, which stands for search engine optimization, and then you have Facebook ads. Now, most companies are pretty good at knowing what the out-of-pocket cost is, you know, because you, you either have to write a check or swipe a credit card or just give somebody cash. So that's, you know, that's very easy to track. 
the one thing that a lot of companies completely over, overlook is how many hours or how much time they spend uh, on that particular campaign. So in this case, um, the SEO campaign uh, took 45 hours and the Facebook ads uh, took two hours. Um, and this is really important because people say, I, I've heard that social media, uh, social media is free so many times. And it's not free. I mean, uh, you have to think about the opportunity cost. That time that you, you're investing uh, in social media, you could be investing in some, doing something else. Now, I'm not saying that social media doesn't work because obviously it does and used properly could be a very powerful tool. What I'm saying is that you have to account for that time. That's a cost that you have as a company. And when you mul multiply your, the number of hours you work by uh, your hourly rate, uh, and then you add your out-of-pocket cost, that's how you get your total cost. Um, and then you have to basically do a, 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 a very simple ROI calculation. You have to know first how much you paid or what the total cost is, and then uh, what, 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 what's the gross profit that you got from that campaign. Uh, so in this case, you know, for SEO, we have an ROI of 117%, which, you know, tells me that this is something that you want to keep doing, whereas the Facebook ads is, you know, it's, um, it's minus 38%. Okay, we're losing money in this campaign. Um, so the, the first question that, that we ask um, ourselves every time we review a campaign is, what's working? And this is not based on what we think is working or how many likes we have on Facebook or how many visitors we have. ROI is the only thing that matters to us. And you were asking earlier about, you know, what makes our agency unique. And I think this is one of the core things that, uh, that makes us unique. We're very ROI focused. You know, we, if, if we're not paying for, for ourselves, we're not doing a good job. Actually, if we're not helping our clients make a profit from the marketing we're doing for them, then we're not doing our job. And ROI is the only way to measure this. Because it doesn't really matter how many visitors you have or how many fans you have on Facebook or how many followers you have on Twitter if people are not buying from you. Uh, so once you know that ROI is how you uh, measure success, it's really easy to tell what's working and what's not. So when something is working, uh, normally you just want to do more of it. Then when, when something is not working, um, that's where we... Um, we said what we call a tripwire, and a tripwire is basically just a deadline we give ourselves. So let's say we you know we're run, we're running a Google AdWords campaign, and our our client uh, needs to acquire uh, new clients at you know let's say fifty dollars uh, uh, each, and we're um, let's say we're a little bit over that. We're we're paying sixty bucks uh, a pop, which makes the whole business model not profitable for this particular client. Okay, well. Uh, we could say, okay, we have one month to take that acquisition cost from $60 to 50 and if that doesn't happen, then we're going to uh, pause the campaign or just kill it. Um, and the reason why trip wires are so important is because um, the, the way the human brain works is you feel like if you've done something for such a long time, you want to keep doing it. You know, you don't want to give up. However, sometimes giving up is the best thing you can do. I mean, if you're doing something that is not working for you, you want to put uh, those resources, whether it's money, time, or a combination of both, towards something else that is going to work better for you. Um, so, yeah, it's really important to first measure your ROI and then, um, you know, based on the, the, the information you get, uh, decide where you're going to keep doing and where you're going to just uh, stop. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that you, you have to give things enough time to, to work. You know, and there are, like for example, there are, um, there are some traffic sources that are paid that you can re get results pretty fast. <laughs> you know, for example, I could turn on a campaign on Google AdWords or Facebook ads and uh, I'm going to be getting traffic to my website within 10 minutes. Uh, so that, that's awesome for, for us marketers because, you know, we get that instant feedback about regarding whether or not something is working. 
But then you have things that are more organic, you know, like social media or, or content marketing or search engine optimization that uh, it just takes longer, you know. And um, I, I don't have a, an exact uh, formula for how long it takes. But for example, for an SEO campaign, it, it could take somewhere between 6 and 12 months uh, for a company to see a positive ROI. And we, you know, in when we work with clients, we we try to do a really good job at setting those expectations right from the get-go. Um, because if you know that something is a long-term investment, you're fine with that. Um, and social media is the same thing. I mean, you're, uh, people don't go to Facebook to buy stuff. Um, they, they go there to socialize. So you have to play that game and you have to uh, connect with people at, at that emotional level. And if you do a really good job, like eventually they're, they're, you're going to have a lot of brand loyalty that you couldn't really get any other way. And that's really powerful and it's very, very uh, important for long-term long growth. But it's not going to happen in a week or two weeks. You just have to give it enough time. And again, how much time you give it, you know, it's really up to you. But, you know, for, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't judge a social media campaign in, in the first six months because nothing is going to happen in the first few months. I mean, you can get some traction, but, you know, it's just going to take a while longer to get a positive ROI. So it's really important to judge uh, each marketing campaign based on um, how long it's... Um, how long it's going to take for that to pay off. And a good way to do this is, uh, one, you can either talk to um, like a, a digital marketing professional uh, who's run similar campaigns in the past who can give you an idea for how long it's going to take. Or you can talk to business owners who have done a really good job and have become successful over time and ask them, you know, how long it, how long it took them. Let and me ask you one thing before you get to the next ahead. point, Zeke. I had a question because you know you may get this question a lot, but what do you say to someone? They're they're using social media, they're doing SEO uh, as best they can, and they're like, I'm not sure if it's working. What do you tell them to use to to track to track those things? Well, again, I mean, uh, ROI to me is the ultimate metric. You know, um, how much how much as a company. Every marketing campaign that you run is an investment, and investment can be either good or bad. You know, if if you're making more gross profit than the the cost of the campaign, then that's a good campaign. That's a good investment that you want to keep. If you're spending more money than you're making, then that that's a bad campaign, and that's a campaign you want to kill. So, um, to me, that's the ultimate test. Um, then there are a lot of different uh, micrometrics that uh, we need to track to make sure uh, to see if the campaign is performing or not. So, for example, for uh, let's say a campaign on Google AdWords, um, ROI to me is the ultimate goal, but I also want to be tracking how many clicks I get over time, uh, my click-through rate, my conversion rate, my cost per acquisition, my, my cost per click. I mean, there are so many different metrics that... Um, that that for example, if I um, if I don't have a positive ROI, I can go back to my micrometrics and try to understand which one I need to work on. Maybe I'm paying too much per click. Maybe my cost per click is is okay, but my conversion rate is very low. Uh, so people are coming to my website, but they're you know bouncing right off because they they don't find the right kind of content. Um, so there's no there's not one answer that. Uh, applies in every single case. Um, this needs to be judged on a case by case basis. Yeah, I'm just wondering because I know I hear a lot. Well, I don't even know if I should bother doing social media because I don't even know if it's working. Is there anything you tell people to use this tool to track it or do it a certain way so you can actually see what's working and what's not, or do you just know it's working and you continue doing the the content on those sites? I would no. say that most people who feel that way pro probably, and I'm just taking a guess here, uh, they probably don't have a clear grasp on, on, on a strategy. You know, they're just like winging it as they go. You know, they're posting uh, to Facebook, but they don't really know why they're posting or uh, what they're trying to get from that or, you know, what the goal is. Um, if, uh, if you have clarity about your goals and 
how you want things to turn out, you'll know right away whether it's working or not. But if you just do things without a real purpose behind it, or you don't have re really any expectations about what you want to get in return, then it's impossible to know, you know if it's working or not, because you don't know what it's supposed to look like. Right. Um, and, you know, I can get into more detail as far as, you know, SEO or social media, um, but, you know, the, the I, I think that a lot of, especially a lot of small business owners, they, I think they try to tackle too much and they don't have the bandwidth to do everything really well. So my, my personal opinion is that it's a lot better to do one thing extremely well than to, like, spread yourself too thin doing five things and, you know, uh, just do a, a an okay job across the board. Yeah, not chasing the next big thing. Like if Pinterest comes out and you're you're trying to do Facebook and Pinterest and YouTube, just focus on what you can do best and just do that one channel first before kind of going to everything. Yeah, and it goes back to rule number two, which is um, reverse engineer your marketing. Um, if you know, let's say Pinterest comes out. Um, does it mean does it mean that you have to jump on Pinterest right away? Well, it depends. Is your audience going to Pinterest uh, to go and pin products in your category? If the answer is yes, that's a space you want to be in. But if the answer is no, then you know, like you don't want to spend your time doing that. So just because there's something new out there, it doesn't mean that you have to do it. You always have to think about how people buy and uh, create a presence where where they're gonna go look for for content. Yeah, that's a good point. So you were going to say, what what are we do not doing that we should be? Right, and that's uh, yeah. I guess that's the the third question. Um, when it, these are the three questions that we ask ourselves uh, when we uh, we actually reassess every one of the campaigns we work on every three months. Uh, we send our clients, you know, uh, weekly updates and monthly reports. But every three months, we have a strategy meeting. Uh, with you know everybody in, in the agency and the client, and we we ask the three questions. We put all the cards on the table. Uh, our our other uh, our third um, um, company value is transparency. So um, you know some things that you do work really well, and some just don't. So we our philosophy is that you have to put all your cards on the table, show the client what's going on, and um, you know in. in and not everything works, but it, it, you have to be pretty good at uh, being on top of things. So when something doesn't work, you just you know you go around it or you just go in a different direction. Um, so these are the three questions that we 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 ask ourselves when we have the our quarterly strategy meetings with our clients. What's working, but just purely based on ROI. Uh, what's not working, and what are we not doing that we should be doing? And again, this goes back to rule number two, um, reverse engineer your marketing. And we don't just come up with any ideas that we have that we should be doing. We, we, we try to figure out if people are buying the, uh, right now the same way they were buying three months ago. And if there's any sort of new platform or new, um, new website they, that, that emerged in the last three months, okay, we want to be there and we want to create a presence. Uh, but not just because it's new and it's out there, but because um, our customers are actually using this new tool to find uh, this kind of product. What was an example when you went to a quarterly meeting with uh, a client that that was one of the things that you figured out what you were not doing that you should be? What was one of those things with a client? Uh, um, let's see. Well, we uh, one of our clients has uh, they they sell high performance bathing suits like Speedos and you know like other brands as well. They have uh, seven retail locations across the U.S. Um, we actually had a meeting uh, last week, and what we found is that there's a new a new blog that you know caught uh, just. Become became really popular really really fast, and it's a blog that talk that basically reviews all the different uh, high performance uh, bathing suits. And we realized that 
this was like a small blog a few months ago, but now it's a big deal and everybody's there. So this is a new opportunity that arises that we we started taking advantage of. Yeah, that's a good one. We have to, you really have to keep on top of things. Yeah, and that's that's you know that that's really our job as an agent, agency. You know, like keep an eye on the market and you know and really understand you know how how are people's like how are consumer behaviors in this space changing? You know, what what new websites are out there? What old websites are no longer uh, relevant or popular? You know, definitely. Hmm. Um, okay, then the rule number four is that execution is king. I've read that uh, content is king, uh, cash is king. I guess there are a lot of different kings, but um, I, I, when I when I start, uh, you know, digging a little deeper and talking to people about their marketing campaigns, most of the time they have some pretty good ideas, but they, they, they couldn't execute them the, the way they, they intended to. And this is a big problem because, you know, a good idea that is, is not executed properly is, is, is literally worthless. You know, you, you can't do anything with an idea. So um, I want to share with you some, um, uh, some of the, the things we learned over the last nine years uh, that uh, that allows us to get, you know, from idea to reality. So the first thing we have is uh, quarterly strategy meetings. And I briefly talked about this, uh, but basically what we do is we, we put together a, a very simple uh, spreadsheet that shows uh, the goals we're working on, the tasks, and then who uh, who's responsible for doing each thing, and uh, a deadline for each task. So the main difference between a goal and a task is that the goal is the is the outcome that you expect. So in this case, you could be increasing Facebook fans to forty thousand, or increasing blog subscribers to thirty thousand. These are our goals. I mean, this is how you measure how well you did. Then the tasks are the things that you that you have to do to get there. Um, so um, yeah, it, for every task you have an owner and a deadline because if things are not assigned to one person and they didn't know when they need to do it by, they they're just not gonna get done. So. Um, everything starts with these strategy meetings. In other strategy meetings, we basically try to figure out uh, what it is that we need to work on. Then we have our weekly tactical meetings. So, um, the, again, at the quarterly meetings, we ask ourselves, are we doing the right things? And at the weekly meetings, we ask, are we doing things right? Right, because at the quarterly meetings we want to be very strategic. We want to think about if we're taking the right road and if it's leading us in the right direction. But then every week we want to make sure we're taking the right steps towards uh, towards that uh, direction. You know, we want to make sure we're meeting deadlines. Uh, you know, people in the team have all the elements they need to get to uh, to the next stage and so on. Um, and then finally, what we do is we create uh, daily focus plans. Um, and this is actually a very simple uh, sheet, and we use pen and paper for this. And we, we have a, a, a horizontal line 25% uh, into the page, and we, we only write uh, three priorities above the line, and everything, everything else goes uh, below the line. And we do this because we want to know, like, if you don't do anything else today, what are the three most important things that, that, you, that you need to do to move towards this direction? Um, and doing this, the quarterly meetings, the, the weekly tactical meetings, and the daily focus plans allows us to carry on that vision we have when, when we set up a, a new campaign. Um, because again, you know, ideas are a dime a dozen, but you know, getting them done is really what's gonna, um, you know, make the difference. So, what are some of those priorities that you, you know, if we don't do anything else, we need to do this that you've set? Well, it depends on on, on the campaign you're working on. Um, 
I, I think that most people know the answer to, to these questions. Um, uh, I, I think that if you have a clarity on, you know, what it is that, what goals you're working towards, mm. uh, most people can, most people will, will know what the three most important things are. Um, I think that the problem is that we we tend to take care of the small of the, the small stuff first because it's easier. Um, and a work around around this is instead of uh, doing you know small things like you know sending an email or checking my Facebook or um, what you can do is break down the big project into small tasks. Uh, so for example, if, if you know one of my tasks is uh, to create a website, I mean that's overwhelming. I mean I there are so many steps uh, involved in building a website, you know. So I'm gonna put that off forever because it's just such a such a such a big thing to have on my plate. Well, now if I break down into pieces, and I know that the first step is to um, go online and find five websites that I like. Okay, that's a good start, right? So um, I I think that when when you know when people feel overwhelmed um, about doing their their top priorities. What they need to do is break it down to smaller chunks that so they can just like you know just take one at a time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like let's say take that that goal of increasing blog subscribers because I'm sure you get that that goal. That's a common goal people want to do, right? Yeah. So what are, what are some top priorities that people need to do um, in order to you know, what they should think about to increase their their blog subscribers? Well, the tasks we have here are add subscription box to the blog sidebar, uh, include call to action in blog posts to invite a friend to subscribe, uh, and do a guest post for 3D printing weekly. Uh, so, w which of the things is a priority? I, like, I don't know because this is a fake, a fake example. But um, I again, I think that given a, a list of tasks. Most people know which of these tasks will put them uh, closer towards towards the end line, you know, the finish line. Um, so I think that that's the way to look at it. Is um, out of like, if, let's say you have a list of 20 different things to do, you can ask yourself, out of these 20 things, um, what are which are the three things that will make the most impact that will get me closer, uh, the closest towards my goal. That makes sense. I was curious of what, for you, I know you guys put out a lot of great content. What for you has been a priority in increasing your subscriber base um, for, you know, digital aptitude? Yeah, we actually, um, we, like ourselves, we don't really have a, a goal for uh, increasing blog subscribers. It is not like we don't want to increase our subscriber base. Um, it's just like you can't, you can't do everything at once, you know. Um, somebody, uh, a friend of mine who's very wise, once told me, you know, you can do everything in your life, just not everything at the same time. Um, and that made a ton of sense to me because, um, you know, we are inundated by books that tell you, you know, you can do everything. You know, there's no limits. But you know, th there are limits. You know, you you only have so many hours a day, and if you push yourself too hard, you're gonna be stressed out or sick or, you know, just like divorced or whatever, you know. So I think that it's really important to actually acknowledge that we do have limits and uh, pick the most important things uh, to work on. So I want to increase my blog subscribers um, to, to, you know, whatever number uh, would make sense for us. But that's not a top priority for me right now. I actually have a few other projects on my plate that are more important than that. Um, so, yeah, I... I um, I the the concept of reverse engineering is something that I apply to everything in my life, uh, not only to marketing but to any any sort of thing that I work on. Um, I always start with a vision in mind, with a goal in mind, uh, thinking about you know like where wh what do I want the, the the final outcome to be, and then once you have clarity on what it is that you, what it is that you want to go. Uh, Figuring out what the first step is is normally pretty easy for most people. Um, I, I think that, that that what a lot of people don't don't have is that clarity of what your goal is. 
But once you know that, knowing what the first step is, is um, it's pretty clear. And the way I think about it is like, um, it's like when you go on the road, you know, like, like if I if I want to go from Seattle to New York, I know that um, even if I don't have a GPS or a map, I know that if I start heading uh, east, I'm going in the right direction, you know, and I can't really see the whole road. I mean, I, I, I can only see maybe the next, you know, um, two or three hundred feet, and that that's good enough. Uh, so you, you always have an idea of where it is that you want to go, and you can see the, the next mile, but you can never see the whole uh, the whole path. That's why you know we have um, uh, our our daily focus plans because every day we reassess where we are and what the next steps are. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. You want to have that end in mind. Absolutely. So after rule four, anything else with the execution aspect that we should know? No, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have my contact information here. Um, yeah, tell so people where they can find out more and, uh, and get in touch and say thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my website is uh, digitalaptitude.com. Um, I, I don't like... Uh, you know, talking, uh, saying good things about my own blog, but I guess you know uh, most people really, really like it. So um, just go check it out. See, see if you like it. If you do, I encourage you to, uh, to subscribe. Uh, we're, we we post uh, really good content, and our mission, um, the mission for our blog is that if you don't read anything else about digital marketing by reading our blog, we want you to be at least. Um, at least know the basics of, of what's going on out there. Um, so, and our we write our our blogs for business owners. So we remove all the technical information, uh, and we just like stick to the basics of you know what you need to do to be successful online as a business. Um, so yeah, it's digitalaptitude.com slash blog, um, and feel free to email me at zig at digitalaptitude.com or you know. Uh, uh, follow me on Twitter or, or check, um, connect with me on Facebook. Um, I I got a lot of help from entrepreneurs when I got started, and I I could have never gotten to where I am today without the help of others. So I've always made it a personal mission uh, to you know help out people uh, every time I can, whether or not they can afford to work with us. I at least I try to give people. Um, some information that's going to be relevant to them, or try to point them in the right direction, or you know anything I can do to help, I um, I always do. So um, yeah, just feel free to reach out to me, and I, I'll be happy to help in any way I can. Yeah, I've always noticed that about you, Zeke. Is you are always so helpful. Obviously, I appreciate your time here, and I want to thank you because you could be doing a million other things right now, but you're giving back and. You know, kind of giving us some some overarching strategy that we need to use in our business. And what I'll do right now is I'll take questions um, from the audience. So Zeke, you can uh, you know go out, come back in, and I'm gonna pull up the questions and go through a few um, that we've been getting in. So just um, you can uh, go out, come back in, so that there it's in sync uh, with your your voice. And I have a few questions here which are, are interesting uh, that I'm excited to hear from you. And uh, so thank you. Put any in there uh, in the chat right now. And I'm going to pull them all up. Uh, so you, can, uh, you can put the lower third on there too. And uh, let's see. I, the first question comes from Irene. And she was asking about... Um, which is the best way to improve customers' engagement? Um, she was curious about customers' engagement and any tools that you suggest to use. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to assume that she's talking about uh, marketing, like uh, engagement on, on Facebook or social platforms. Because um, that, that could mean, mean a lot of different things. But... Um, I I think that the, the 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 most important thing is to pay attention to what worked in the past. So, for example, on Facebook, you can actually pull a, a report from Facebook Insights, 
and you can see which post generated the most engagement. Uh, whether they're you know pictures or quotes or videos or just the status updates, um, and you can also see you know what time of the day people respond to better. You know like whether you post it in the morning or in the afternoon. So um, that's that's that to me is really really important. The other thing is uh, a lot of business owners I feel are really um, really afraid of. Um, Asking their audience what they want, you know, and they feel like, hey, I'm the expert, or I, it's my business, it's up to me to come up with all the ideas. But um, the, there's 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 a lot of power in you, like um, co-creating content with, with your audience, asking them what they want to know. Um, you know, they Ben and Jerry even does this for like to to have people pick what ice cream flavors they they want to. They want them to make next. You know, they they just ask him. So I um, I would say that number one, uh, check your past data because there's a lot of information there that is going to help you. And number two, uh, just ask people what they want and learn from what what worked for you in the past. Yeah, that's a good one. I wouldn't even think to use Facebook Insights, and that's that's actually really uh, valuable. Um, two more questions for you, Zeke. I appreciate your time. One is. Um, why most companies with great ideas fail at executing? I know you talk about this and people should check out, you, you put out a book on your site and one of the points was why most companies with great ideas fail at executing. Yeah, um, being an entrepreneur is extremely difficult. It's, it's not for everybody. It takes an incredible amount of strength. Um, at times, you just feel lonely. You know, um, I, I I cried more times than I, I'm, I, more times that I care to admit. Um, it, it it is really hard. I mean, it takes uh, it takes a lot of strength um, when when things are not working out. I mean, it's it's a lot easier to say you know okay you know screw this I'm gonna go get a job than to say you know no this I'm not gonna give up I'm gonna keep going. Uh, so I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of work it's going to take, um, and I I know from personal experience that sometimes you know what it is that you you need to do, but sometimes you're not willing to do it. Like with one of my companies, um, I I started a company called Lux Leathers, and I was importing leather goods from the, uh, Argentina into the U.S. Uh, like you know like high end um, handbags and boots and stuff like that. And um, I tried to sell online, and it was just not taking off. Then um, a friend of mine who's like very outgoing and has a very magnetic personality just took some of my products and went around uh, my town and actually sold like five thousand dollars in a day. And she actually had to leave, and she's like, you know, I had to leave town, but hey, keep doing this because it works. But um, I had just moved to the U.S. My English was very, very basic. You know, I only knew a few words, and I was very self-conscious about you know just going and knocking on doors and you know selling these purses, and um, so I knew exactly what it is that it, that I had to do, but I, I didn't have the self-confidence to um, to just go and do it. And um, being an entrepreneur uh, requires for you to be outside your comfort zone most of the time, and most people are not okay with that. That's a good point. So, how do you stretch? Your comfort zone. Um, I think that you do it one step at a time. Um, it's uh, I, I like using the, the analogy of a rubber band. You know, you stretch it, and it goes back to like it never goes back to the original size. It always gets a little bigger. Uh, so the more you keep stretching it, the bigger it's gonna get. Um, I. At least for me, I, I, I make it a personal mission to always do things that make me feel uncomfortable. And I do this on purpose. You know, I go, um, when I had anxiety about talking to people, I started approaching strangers and just starting conversations. And I was having conversations that didn't really matter. So if I screwed up, you know, like it wasn't a big deal because I was like talking to people at Starbucks and, you know, um, you know, just like, even though I'm married, I told my wife, "Hey, I'm gonna go start talking to girls." Like, uh, <laughs> I'm sure she likes that. 
But, you know, this makes me feel extremely uncomfortable, so I have to do it. And she's really cool, so she said, yeah, do what you need to do. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, and, and it, it's a muscle, you know. It's like, it's like working out. The more you do it, the, the easier yeah. it gets. Um, so the first time I, you know, I, I had to talk to a stranger, it was like I was, like, sweating, shaking. Now I just do it very easily. So it says, like, you have to know that um, it's going to get easier and easier over time. And um, just doing it for the first time is probably 50% of the work. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And, and the last question, Zeke, and I'm especially interested in this because I know you read a lot. And what are some of your favorite business books that you'd recommend? I actually wrote a, uh, a blog post about that. Um, do you want me to paste it here, email it to you, or just tell you? What, yeah, what, what are your top, like, if someone were to start, so, like, Zeke, I just need three books right now. What will be the top three that you, you'd like, you need to start here? Hmm. I read one um, a few months ago that I really liked uh, called Positive Intelligence. Um, and the whole premise of the book is that we have uh, both positive and negative emotions and how, how well we deal with them uh, makes all the difference. So that would be one of them. Um, then probably some sort of sales book. Um, I feel like if you can sell, you can, you can be successful at anything. Uh, everything is, is sales, you know, whether you're selling a, an idea to your employees or uh, finding an investor or just like selling something. Um, so for for the service industry, one that I really enjoyed is called uh, Let's Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. Um, I, I don't think it, it's a very good book for like product sales or um, yeah, it's mostly for like corporate sales or B2B. Um, I like your point that you made with the sales aspect. Like, if you basically everything is selling, is there anyone that you like to follow online or that's um, sort of an expert that you look at look up to uh, in that in that realm? Um, not for sales. I, I don't really follow anybody. I, I, read, a, I read a couple of books and um, I think I'm naturally a good salesperson. I, I feel like I'm a decent communicator and I, and I really care about our clients. So if, you know, I think that the most important thing we, uh, uh, to be a good, good salesperson is to really care for the other person, to look for the best deal for both parties. Because if you try to like Get the best for you at the, at the you know expense of the other person. I mean, they're they're gonna find out sooner sooner or later. Um, yeah, I, I I don't have somebody that I, that I follow online yeah. for for sale. Yeah, one thing I do notice about you, which is probably has maybe the opposite effect that you want, is that you are very you're not attached to the sale. You're not attached to the person. You're very quick to say see if it doesn't fit, then just tell them this isn't gonna work out. And I can see that doing the opposite, which is you tell them, you know, this isn't a good fit, and they now they want to work with you even more because you're almost pushing them away a little bit, and you're being honest. Do you find that happens? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I didn't used to be this way at all. Um, I, I wanted to, to like basically um, every person I talked to, I wanted them to be our clients, you know. And um, what I found is that the wrong kind of clients can actually uh, drag you down and stop you from growing. Um, I was very naive when I started the agency, and I felt like, hey, revenue is revenue, right? Like, if they're, they're willing to pay you, why not take their money? But, like, w what I didn't consider is all the hidden costs of having certain clients. Um, if you have someone paying you, you know, just a few hundred bucks a month and calling you every single hour, like, you know, it's just, you're just not... It's it's drifting you in a different direction. You know, you just don't have time to focus, and you don't have to, uh, time to be productive. So, not all revenue uh, is created equally. You know, so I, I just found that. Um, uh, so so now I I know that if our philosophy is in line with the philosophy of our clients, great. You know, we because we only need to like get a client once, and hopefully, if we do a good job, which we normally do. We'll, we're going to be with that client for you know five, ten years, and we don't need to keep getting new clients every single month. So, get, making sure it's the right fit, it's um, it's it's really my best interest. And if it's not, I I just don't want to waste their time or ours. 
Yeah, yeah. Zeke, I really appreciate your time. This has been very valuable. Everyone, check out the site, digitalaptitude.com, and then if you want to go to the blog, they have the really, really good content on there. I'm, I actually follow it, and that's why I was asking about the subscribers, because I'm a subscriber, so I'm wondering what you did to get me in there. Um, but thank you so much, Zeke. It's been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you.